Well, uh, let's get started. Uh, Brent here is going to talk about uh, hacking web apps. Apparently, either that or he has a very misleading first slide. So let's all uh, let's give uh, Brent White a big hand. Thanks. Thanks man. All right. Hey, thanks, guys, for coming. Just to let you know, this is probably going to be the most disappointed that you've been in a long time. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that now. All right. Let's talk about uh, baking apple pies this morning. Uh, my name is Brent White. I'm a security consultant with Solutionary. And uh, if you have any questions, I know there's a lot of people. So if you have questions about anything I talk about or maybe something I didn't mention, please contact me on Twitter. I will respond to the best of my ability. All right. This was not my choice to put this on here, but for my own protection, <laughs> thank you for, uh, for having me add this there, Michael Bourne. Everybody got it? There. Okay, so basically in this talk, I'm going to talk about, as, as, a, as a pen tester, what happens from the very beginning uh, all the way to the end for an assessment for web applications. Due to time, I'm not going to be able to talk about actual web services, but mostly, most specifically, web applications. So there are a few things that have to start, that have to happen before you legally go and start hacking someone's website. What are all those things? Well, once uh, you go through contract and, and scoping and sales, then it comes down to us, and we have what's called a kickoff call. And during this call, we talk about what. Uh, what are they expecting? Do they have a specific thing they want us to focus on? So if it's a bank, then they probably want us to try and focus on getting user data or credit information, things like that. So we talk about exactly what they're wanting. We talk about the limits, uh, no denial of service, you know, avoid this web page, please don't you know, delete data or anything like that. And then the scope, and that actually is what website what is the application, the URL. Next, in case something breaks, all hell breaks loose or something, you have to have a point of contact, somebody that you can call and say, hey, didn't mean to do this, but your site's down, or you know, whatever might happen. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but you know, it's not a perfect world. And remember, a report is always expected at the end of an assessment. So the more evidence that you collect, the easier your life is going to be when you're reporting. Uh, so before I get started, there's a few things that I like to set up. That way, as I'm going along, I can just copy paste and put evidence as I'm going. That way, at the end, when I'm report writing, I'm like, well, you know, shoot, I forgot to take a screenshot of this. So what do I use? Well, KeepNote is my actual uh, application of choice. It's built in with Kali Linux, and it's also available for other platforms. Uh, again, there's several options, such as Dratus and other things like that. Just explore whatever works best for you, what you're most comfortable with. One of the reasons that I like KeepNote is that you can easily create scripts. You can do scripting for it, and it's very expandable. And you can easily export it as HTML files to give to a client or to share with your uh, team members as well. And so just to kind of show you how I might group things, uh, the one side says by IP. So if I have several IPs or several applications I'm looking at, and I want to make sure that I'm covering each one, then I might break it out and do a folder for each specific application or IP. Um, or if it's, if it's a smaller scope, then I'll just do it by vulnerability. And as you can see, I, I've gone in and color-coded them. The darker ones are obviously your higher risk. And then the green, I do that. This is a, vi a visual reference of just information that I can go back to, such as what's the scope or uh, anything else that I might need to reference quickly. A few things, uh, evidence gathering. Whenever you're going to report on a vulnerability, then you want to try and document the request and response for each vulnerability. That way, when you give the report to the client, they can try and, and replicate it and, and try to resolve the issue. Any unscheduled downtime or issues, so if the client asks you to stop testing because there's latency or some issue with the application, you want to document that for you know, the report review call. Uh, changes in test, test data, so if you do create test accounts 
or you modify, let's say you get into someone else's account and you modify information, let them know that way they can go by back and repair that if you happen to be testing in a live environment. Um, and then again, and if you're testing something like a bank website or an online store or something and you're doing transactions, you want to log those. That way, of course, they can cancel that and give you your money back. And then this next one should be pretty obvious. Don't share any screenshots or data of any hacks that you found for the client. That probably wouldn't make them happy and you'd be against a, a, your agreement in the contract. So um, I, I, I'm going to apologize. There's so much stuff to cover, so I'm going to try and keep things high level. That way, those who are interested in getting into hacking web apps, this is more of an outline for you to go back and say, like, kind of look at the names of the programs and learn these programs and to kind of just kind of get you on the right track of how to get started. So evidence gathering, you want to make sure when you do find a vulnerability that you get a, a clear, legible screenshot of that vulnerability. That way, when you put it in the report, you can actually tell what it is. I've seen a few reports where it was really tiny. It was a screenshot of the entire screen, and the part that mattered, you couldn't really read it because it was so small. So just you know, trim out the stuff that isn't needed, make it where it's nice and big, and you can actually read it. So call out the specific issue during the write-up. That way, they can, again, they can actually see what was sent. So you can see the highlighted part where uh, on this particular one I found SQL injection. And so I highlighted the payload or the, the code that was sent for the username parameter. And then again, as you're going through, let's say for example, the SQL, uh, the SQL injection I was just talking about, if there are multiple parameters, you wanna go through and look at that for each, each and every parameter. So you actually wanna go through and document every parameter that's vulnerable to that particular SQL injection, for example. Uh, don't just find one and just give them one. You actually need to be diligent and go through and look at every parameter to make sure everything's being covered. And then you want to have a certain, you have a methodology or a checklist to go by. And when I say checklist, I want to be very clear that I'm not limiting you to that checklist. That's just merely a reminder. Okay, have I have I fuzz all of these perimeters? Have I have I looked at this? Have I looked at this? And this is just a, kind of a thing to help keep you on track because uh, as a pen tester, you're going to be doing a lot of things like this, and uh, you know, have maybe have several projects going on at once. So this is just kind of a tip to help keep you uh, keep you on track to make sure that you're not overlooking or forgetting something. That way, the client is getting the most value for their dollar. And then again, you know, you're not trying to go to sleep one night and then you remember, oh, I, I totally forgot to look at this whole portion of this application. So at the end, you know, it does kind of make you happy, I guess, that I had to find a stupid picture for this one. So there you go. Okay, now getting into uh, getting into the actual assessment part, you want to look at anything you can find, the OSINT, which stands for Open Source Intelligence, if you're not familiar with that, you actually want to go through, use different tools search, such as search engines. Uh, if there's been a previous compromise, you might find credentials on something like Pastebin, uh, Recon NG, all these, there are several different tools for OSINT that actually will crawl and help save time by crawling the web for you and, and finding this data. Uh, Again, look for any previous hacks. That's always a good thing to tell a client. Like, like you guys have already been owned. You've got a lot of cleaning up to do. Uh, any, uh, any known malware or anything? Or anything? I don't know where that came from. So, again, this is a manual process. It's very time-consuming, but it can be very, very rewarding. And why is that? Well, I've actually found database types, database schemas, test credentials, and so much more information through archived emails, uh, uh, development forums, so many things that have pretty much given me the keys to the kingdom for that assessment. Talking about more about OSINT, there's a great tool by Lee Baird called Discover. And uh, you can look at the 
the screen and kind of get an idea of a few things that it covers for you. The automation tool will help things go a little quicker. Okay, so you might be asking, well, if you're a hacker, why are you running automated tools? You know, that's not cool. You're supposed to go in and do everything manually. And, you know, according to Hollywood, the typer you fa the faster you type, the, you know, the better of a hacker you are, things like that. Okay, well, uh, automated tools are great because they actually are a huge time saver with assessments. They cover a wide, a wide range of tests very quick. And it really helps you to find the low-hanging fruit. Uh, to be very clear on this, and this is something that I know a lot of other pen testers get really irritated about, a vulnerability scan is not a pen test. I know that's a, a common misconception. So uh, if you know people that think this, please correct them. It's just a vulnerability scan. It's only doing what the, the scanner knows what to look for. It's not putting in that human element of manual testing. So, and to those that still think a vulnerability scan is a pen test, then this is you right here. So, <laughs> so why use automated scanners? Again, they, they cover a lot of things. And so, one, once they're finished, you still need to go through and validate the things they found. So, you want to weed out any false positives. Uh, I know a lot of automated scanners have tools where you can actually replay a request to see if you can get the same response or maybe modify it to see if it is a false positive. Don't just rely on those results because there are several that will give you false positives on you know, the same vulnerability over and over on several web apps. So I'm not saying anything bad about the scanners, but you know, trust, but you know, verify as well. So automated scanners, I want to talk about a few that, uh, that I like to use and uh, some of the more popular ones out there. Nessus by Tenable is great. Uh, it looks at the host, the web app, you know, everything uh, SSL, TLS layer. It also does basic content discovery and uh, it just kind of looks at it as a whole. IBM App Scan is another one that we like to use and it's a little more focused. You can... Uh, you can go in and you know you can modify a lot of things from parameters that you don't want to have looked at, pages you want to exclude, and things like that. So it's it's a little more focused for web apps, and uh, it's it's a tool we like to use. Another favorite of mine, which you'll hear me talk about quite a bit, is Burp Suite Pro. It has a built-in active scanner that uh, will actually go through and look at things similar to other scanners. And you can also spider content. So basically what spidering does is when you load a page, anything, any links or anything that are, that are in that page, it will visit that. And then on that page, any links, it will visit that. And basically it just keeps spidering out, trying to go ahead and, and build the trees and everything for you so you can see it's sort of a layout of that application. And Nick2, I like this Nick2, Nick2, however you say it, uh, it's, it's a pretty good tool, too, for looking for default pages, known vulnerabilities, uh, CGI testing, and quite a bit more. And I like to use this standalone because it gives me a lot more control and help I can really dial down based on that specific web app that I'm looking at. So if you're dealing with a framework such as WordPress or Drupal or Joomla and things like that, there are actually automated scanners geared towards those as well. WP Scan, obviously, that's for WordPress. Uh, it looks for known WordPress vulnerabilities, outdated plugins, and so on. The ones for the other platforms also do, do similar things. So look into those. Those are all built into Kali. A good one for finding sort of brute forcing directories that might not be linked in any other way is Durbuster by OWASP. Uh, it's probably kind of hard to see on this screenshot, so I apologize. But basically, you can load your own custom lists or use the lists that come with it. And you can go through and just let it run, and it will try to find and locate its hidden files and folders. Very useful. Make sure you give yourself enough time for this because it can take a while. 
And again, there are many more pre-installed options in Kali, and this sort of shows you the directory structure where you can go in and find these tools if you're not familiar with the operating system. And then there are other you know, free options such as Saints and Nexpos and numerous others. So uh, just kind of you know, get familiar with these tools, find what works best for you. And I know on YouTube and other things, there are several videos, free tutorials to help you learn these specific tools. And sorry, I don't have enough time to really cover all those things with you today. But again, this is just sort of to help you get going in the right direction and get started. Uh, automated scanning, pro tips. Verify the settings of the automated scanner. Don't just put in the URL and click go. That's it's caused problems. It's just not really a smart thing to do. You want to look at the settings. Make sure you're not going to you know, do something that's going to cause denial of service. Clients we found out never like that at all, so avoid that. Uh, you know, If you need to throttle it back and change the number of threads, uh, do that too. And again, you can add uh, pages or functions that they might want you to avoid. And something that we found is kind of common with web apps is a client will say, hey, this page is our contact page. If you scan it, we're going to get thousands and thousands of emails from your automated scanner. And that can flood things. It's caused problems. So make sure that you ask, what do you want us to avoid? What pages do we need to stay away from? Because um, there are times where that will cause issues. And then when you're all ready and you've got everything set up after you've verified the settings, you can start the scan. Uh, okay, now let's talk about some manual testing. And this, this kind of bleeds over into automated. So again, once your automated scanners are finished and you have some things to go after, instead of just verifying those things, see if you can take those further. So you don't want to just see... Uh, okay, well, there's potential cross-site scripting, and then go and do a pop-up alert box of one. You know, that's pretty lame. Doesn't If you really need to show a, an executive of why this is important to allow budget or something to actually get this fixed, go deeper. Uh, look at, you know, maybe including uh, keystroke scripting or hooking the browser with Beef or something like that, the, the Beef application. There's so many more things you can do with it. So actually look at those results and, and take them further than just the automated scanner. So make it look more real world. What would an attacker do? That's what you're trying to get across here. Uh, and then you actually want to explore the application through a proxy program. And again, there's Burp Suite Pro again. It's an excellent program. Um, all the guys I work with, that's kind of a standard application for us. Uh, you, again, there's the spidering and content discovery tools to help you find more things that you might not see when you're manually going through each page. Um, and then again, the, the Durbuster from OWASP. Uh, you know, a way to sort of tailor exploits and see what it might be vulnerable to is to look at the server response, kind of verify what is this running, because most of the time, it will tell you, you know, Apache and then the version number or IIS and so on. That way you can see, okay, this is how I need to focus my scanners or my attacks towards this, this host. Parameters. Parameters are basically anything that take value and they send it on to get a response. Um, you just want to look at those. And you want to, let's say if the parameter is name, okay, instead of just putting in names, Try putting in actual, you know, maybe SQL injection or cross-site scripting or anything that is not expecting. And that's kind of the whole point, right, is take something and give it information that it's not expecting to try and make it behave different. If you can do that and start getting different responses, that is kind of the rabbit trail you want to go down. Cross-site scripting, again, I've, I've already mentioned that. If you're not familiar with cross-site scripting, you got to look it up. you got to become familiar with it because there are a lot of really good attack vectors and more websites are vulnerable to this than we would like. Also, you want to look up things like uh, cross-site uh, cross request forgery, um, SQL or LDAP injection, local and remote file inclusion. 
So again, in Burp Suite Pro, you can actually load your own list. So if you have a long list of, of cross-site scripting or SQL injection commands that you want to throw in a parameter, you can load those in, or it comes with ones, some, some pretty solid ones already that you can try. Uh, Xenotix, however you say that, by OWASP, is also a really good cross-site scripting uh, testing tool. It's for Windows platform, and basically it shows three uh, browser types, and you tell it the URL and the parameter, and it will just run and run and run. And it will actually go through. And I, I found a few things from this that other tools didn't find or that I couldn't find through some manual testing. So I highly recommend checking that out. And then if you think you have SQL, a possible SQL injection, save that request uh, to a file. And then you can actually run that through SQL Map or other uh, SQL Ninja, Barbecue SQL. There's so many different types of uh, SQL injection tools built into Kali or for other operating systems as well. So uh, something else you want to look for, whenever information is being sent, is it sensitive information? In the URL, is it showing the username and the password in clear text? Does it have the session cookie? And as silly as that sounds, we've actually found that several times. And so if someone's sniffing traffic or it's saved in the history, then someone's got, you know, the, they can grab that, that session token and, and become your user or, you know, if they see your username and password or even if they just find your username, you can start brute forcing with password lists and try to make your way in that way. Okay, and to prevent death by PowerPoint, because I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, we'll look at this happy dog with a, with a hot dog for a second. Oh, has anybody seen the video of this, by the way? It's this dog just standing there, and they give it a hot dog, and it has its eyes closed, like, and it's so happy, and it just, like, wags its tail for, like, like two minutes. So. Okay, and moving along. Uh, authentication. These are, these are things I'm uh, telling you that you actually want to look at for for bypassing things and to actually hack the websites. So authentication, can it be bypassed? And what does that mean? Well, if there is a URL for admin, can you get to that URL as an unauthenticated user? Or if you're not an admin, if you're just a regular user, can you still view that? Those are things that you want to look for. Uh, when you log off, can you take that session token, put it, you know, and log, use it again? Or does it create a new one every time you log in? Uh, this is, you know, something else you can try if you're logged in as one user. Can you go ahead and log in under the same username in a different browser? Does it allow mul multiple se sessions? Sometimes that's not really a bad thing, but I think, you know, based, you know, given certain cases, for example, a bank, you might not want to allow the same user to be logged in at the same time on a website. You want it to end that session of the other person. That way, uh, this, you know, provides a little more security with that. You also want to look at password requirements. Can you set your password to one, two, three, or banana, or something that's easily guessed, you know, a very common password? You want to make sure that it's strong password requirements for that application. When you change your application, can you go back and use an old password again? Why is that bad? Well, let's say you've been compromised before, and that list is on the website, and someone says, well, okay, time to change my password, and their old password is out there, and then again, they say, oh, I want to use that password again. Well, there's a possibility that, that an attacker can come, come by and use that list of passwords that were found from a previous breach, and if it's their current password again, or it's never been changed, you've got problems. Uh, look at the host, not just the web app. Again, you know, what is it running? Is it Apache? Is it a vulnerable uh, version of Apache. Are there admin portals available like cPanel? Uh, if so, you know, try default credentials for that. Brute force it. See what you can do to get in. Uh, there have also been a few times where we've found backup files, backup database files. So you just grab those with no authentication. You go through, you find the information, usernames, passwords. It's pretty good, good stuff for us 
not for the company necessarily. Again, with the host, uh, do they have any dangerous HTTP methods enabled, such as put and copy? As you know, you can uh, group those together to basically compromise the host. Delete, that's pretty obvious why that would be bad. So you want to look at those things, you know, are they vulnerable to directory traversal or shell shock or heart bleed or whatever else is out there that's a known vulnerability with, you know, easily to get, you know, public exploits. Again, you want to look at SSL TLS settings. Are they using weak ciphers with known vulnerabilities? If they are, you want to document that stuff, take care of it, let them know. And again, um, you know, there are methodologies, methodologies from OWASP as well as, uh, you know, several other checklists to kind of help you stay on track. And these things will let you know kind of how to look for different things. And so if you're new to uh, assessing or hacking web apps, go to, what, go to the OWASP site, look at their methodology, and that will actually help, you know, help you walk through exactly what to look at, what things to look for, how to assess those, and so on. Um, then, practice in the lab. If you're new to this, you do not want to be learning this stuff while you're touching a client website. Bad things can happen. Uh, just make sure you take the time to set up a lab. There's a lot of information on how to set up labs out there. Uh, so, you know, check that out if you're not too familiar. And then once you're ready, go hack some websites. So that's that's basically it for my slides and my talk. I think we have some more time if anybody has questions or anything. So the question was, is there anything that I recommend for setting up a lab? Um, you know, there, it, it kind of depends on exactly what you're wanting to do. I mean, if you're wanting to look at web apps, there are, um, guys, tell me, what's the name of the, the VM? Yeah, there, there, there's so many different vulnerable VMs that you can download that are like, purposefully vulnerable. So you can go in and test things like SQL injection and things like that. Uh, base, so basically, just you know, if you run a VM, few VMs on your machine, that'll be enough to get you started. Just so. Any more questions? My favorite tool, probably the Monkey Wrench. No, Burp Suite Pro, uh, honestly, is my favorite. It's the it's pretty robust. You can actually, again, as I've mentioned, you can there's manual testing, automated scanning throw in your own lists, you can craft your own responses, and there's so much that you can do with Burp Suite. So, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not a... Sorry, no sequel? Okay. Okay. Oh, if like MongoDB, things like that? Yeah, there are there are tools uh, like that as well. You know, I mentioned um, like SQL Map and things like that. There are also tools written specifically for testing SQL injection against MongoDB and things like that out there as well. Great question. So, get, how do you help developers recreate the attacks? So earlier when I was talking about reporting. Uh, in the reporting, in a good report, it will actually show you the requests that that I sent to the server. So it'll be the full post or get requests or whatever it was. And I will actually highlight in there what I sent that was malicious and that caused that abnormal activity. And I give that to you and you guys can use something like Burp Suite or uh, Fiddler or something else where you can actually just copy and paste that request in there hit send, and you should get the same results. So.
a, a plug-in for Burp for Yeah, so well, again, that's one of the great things about Burp is because it's so widely used, it's being actively developed for, and there's a great plugin for it, uh, specifically for SQL Map, where you can, there's a, after you go and set up the tool and everything, you basically just send that straight into uh, that plugin, and it will run it through SQL Map and everything for you. Then if it finds something, a tab will open up and it'll link and say, hey, we found something. That way, you know, it does save time uh, from the manual process of, you know, command line from SQL Map. So that is an option. What's that? SOAP and REST APIs. Uh, you can use those as well it, through Burp. You can also test those. And I know IBM... IBM App Scan also you can you know throw the like the Wizzle and everything in there and help fuzz those parameters and things like that. Was that was that the question? Okay, cool. Yeah, so the question, make, make sure I got this right. So the example that I showed where I found the SQL injection in the username parameter, is that something I would tell the client right away? Yeah, so we have a, a process where if we find uh, like a serious or what we consider a critical vulnerability, we escalate that right away to let them know, hey, this is here. Uh, this is pretty, it was pretty easy to find, pretty easy to exploit, and we got some information we shouldn't have been able to get. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, other than that being a pretty common and frustrating thing, uh, you just, that's again, that's where you want to find these exploits and try to take them further and make them more real world, world scenario. That way you can say, okay, obviously this, this vulnerability exists. This is what an attacker could do with it because this is what we actually did. And here is proof that we did this. And and then they'll argue, well, I don't see that that's a critical risk. It needs to be a low or, you know, something silly like that. So basically you just, you go to them and there might be certain cases where, uh, based on the vulnerability, you know, where maybe it could be, you know, lowered a little bit based on their use. But that's just something that you need to talk to the client about. Uh, but just make sure that you document things well. Again, you, you exploit it to the fullest within the scope. And then you just let them know, hey, this is how you guys could really be screwed over. And then you just, you just take the dialogue from there and kind of work it out between client. So. so how, I'm sorry, I didn't quite... Yeah, so you're talking about, you know, how basically how do you evade their IDS, things like that. So when this is something that we actually talk about during the kickoff call is they will say, well, you know, we have this firewall in place and you say, well, that's good, but we only have a week on this project. We don't have time to really go through and, uh, you know, craft everything to see if we could potentially bypass this. So uh, you want to let them know, hey, whitelist us because we don't really that's pretty cool. We don't really have time to do this. So you just let them know, hey, this is a time thing. You let us see what's behind that. That way, if an attacker does get behind that, then we fix those issues. Can you help me with this? Yeah, I could probably help you with that. One second, please. No, 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 keep going. Uh, never mind. <laughs> Ask the guy next to you that asked that a second ago. This is a, oh, he got it, cool. 
Let me explain what's going on. How many people are first timers here? All right. So we have a little tradition at DEF CON. If you speak at DEF CON and this is your first time, you have to take a shot during your talk. And it's just kind of how we do it here. First time listeners have to bring their own, but thank you. All right. Welcome to DEF CON. Welcome to DEF CON. Thank you guys. I'm glad you did that towards the end. Yeah, so what do I read each week? What do I look at to stay current on things? I'll tell you, um, this might not sound like the most professional thing, but I get more useful information from Twitter and from following InfoSec leaders on their fellow hackers. Uh, uh, those guys, I mean, constantly, that's, that's what we do, right? So when we find something, when we see an article, you might see the same article 15 times in an hour, but you saw it, right? So let's say, for example, Shellshock dropped. My whole feed, that as soon as it came out, it's talking about Shellshock. The next hour, it was so-and-so has developed a, you know, a proof of concept or an exploit. Check it out here. So within a couple hours of Shellshock being announced, we were, you know, the guys we work with, we were all already trying out these proof of concepts and, and code. And then you heard about it on the news or, you know, a larger thing, you know, maybe two or three days later, everyone's freaking out about this. But here we are actually already trying it out. So uh, Twitter is a great resource. So, yeah. HTML5, yes, there are some. Actually, uh, just a quick Google search, and you'll you, there's actually a few tutorials and tests and things like that that you can go through and practice it, things you can look for. So, yeah, it does have some issues. See, I think I got time for just a couple more. What kind of application? Any good application for testing the Mongo? I'm sorry, I, I'm having a really hard time here. <laughs> you like scream it at me like like I owe you money or something. Mean applications, any resources for testing mean applications? Not anything that I can think of right off, sorry. Uh, just message me on Twitter. I'm sure I've got something I can send it over to you. Anything else? All right, guys, you've been awesome. Thank you for, uh, for listening to my talk today. Appreciate it. Again, if you have questions, contact me on Twitter. Find me outside, uh, and then I'll, I'm more, to more than happy to do what I can for you. Thank you.